Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Bakari. Today I'm joined by Joseph Casali, who is running for Providence City Council in Ward 4. In this ward, the incumbent, Councilman Nick Narducci, is term limited, which opens up the seat for 2022. The ward is located in the north end of Providence, containing the Charles and Wanskett neighborhoods. Joe, how are you today? I'm very good. It's good to have you on. First question, you're running for City Council in Ward 4. Well, not officially filing yet, but you are planning to. Can you tell us watching a little bit about yourself and why you're best to represent the ward? I've lived in that area for many, many years. My father had a business there for decades, and I started a separate business on that street. Uh, that's my neighborhood. That's my home. And I have seen that neighborhood deteriorate to a point that I find is no longer acceptable. And since I have the tools, the knowledge, the experience, I think I can turn it around with help from everybody else. If you motivate people to take pride in their neighborhood, which is something that we've lost there, if you motivate people they will all fall in line and they will all join together. It's like the, if you go into a very clean hotel lobby and it is spotless, you're less apt to throw the candy wrapper on the floor. But if you go into an area that's less than what it should be, you throw the candy wrapper down. And what has happened there is they have tolerated bad behavior. That is why that area is deteriorating because you can, behave badly and get away with it and that is basically why that neighborhood is turning into less than what we want it to be you know if i'm elected if you have a drug dealer i'm coming for you if you have a drug habit i will get you help that's not foreign to me over the years when i had my store on child street uh, many families came to me. I was very fortunate. I had a drug treatment uh, educational facility right across the street. So you just march people by the hands up into the building, sit them down with the council, and we did what we could. Uh, but the drug dealers have to go. The absentee landlords that pay no, um, pay no respect to the community, they've got to go. Either that or they got to get in line. And it's easy to put them in line. Have code enforcement do their job. So, in other words, along Light Street, where you see 20 trash buckets that are in violation of the city codes that are never put back in the yard, even after the trash has been picked up, and they're there till the next week. Well, there's a law against that. There's an ordinance against that. And that ordinance should be enforced. 530 Charles Street right now. There are mattresses between two buildings. Not only are they unsightly, they're also a fire hazard. Those buildings are not that far apart. If some, someone decided to light up one of those mattresses, we're going to lose two buildings there. That's complete negligence. It's negligence on the city. It's negligence on just about everybody who's responsible for it, whether it be code enforcement or the city as a whole. And they've tolerated this. People have been so numb to it, they tolerate it. And that is not how you run a community. We are 100 policemen short. That's a problem. Jorge has not really sufficiently addressed that. Why he hasn't put more policemen on, I haven't a clue. But the reason why this city is deteriorating, and even in that area, is because they know they can get away with it. That's that's bottom line. You go, all right, my house. He can tell you, I don't lock the door. I don't have to. Because I have a dog who shows her face, uh, her I pan a smile at the window to just about anybody who goes by. So why break into his house because it's harder because we have to wrestle with a dog? So let's go to the house next door where there is no dog. And that's the same thing here. If there is a police presence, and I'm not saying a police state, I'm saying a police presence, there is less apt to have a lot of crime or random crime. They tell me those restaurants along Westminster Street, Yolenny's and a few of the others, they have outside diners. And they cannot stop 
because it's a repeated problem of panhandlers going up to their diners when people are having dinner and people are going up to them and asking them for money and God knows what. That's no way to run a, a business community. That's no way to run a business. I mean, it's not their fault. There was no footman on Westminster Street, no footman on Way Boston Street, no footman on Washington Street. Now, when I started the police department many years ago on the administrative staff, because I had to work my way through college, the one you're going to, and uh, I would go there midnight to eight, and then it was midnight to eight in those days, then go to school, then shoot back to the, um, they've eliminated that system, it was outright unhealthy, then work from four to midnight. Uh, it was a good experience. But what I remember the most is we had footmen downtown. Every major street there, Washington, where Bassett, uh, Westminster, had a footman. Of course, you know, they would walk. Of course, they all joined together too. People are human and uh, they get, you know, a policeman and a policeman. They want to see each other too. But there was a police presence. They met the business people. The other people knew they were there. They were not far away if you needed one. Now there is nobody. What we do have in front of all those businesses are all potholes. Welcome to the city of Providence. Come and look at us. We have broken streets right down the main drag of our business district. And I know I'm not wrong. All you have to do is go there and look at it. I mean, I'm not hiding it. I didn't make it up. Welcome to the city of Providence, Providence Place Mall, right in front of the door to go in. All the concrete and the asphalt is broken. Welcome to Providence. Come and look at our beautiful mall. If you don't fall in the pot, we're getting in. That's why I'm running. Uh, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, but real, real briefly, uh, what are some of the key issues you plan to focus on when you're knocking on doors asking them? Common sense. Bringing common sense solutions to problems. Simply common sense. That's what appears to be lacking right now is common sense. There's nothing wrong with new ideas. They're great. New ideas are good. But common sense also has to be applied, and that's what we are, that's what we are short on right now is common sense. Reality, reality, reality. The rhetoric has got to meet the reality. It has to. People who say, well, we should take out the uh, housing security uh, police people in the schools and use that money to hire more guidance counselors. Yes, we need more guidance counselors. There's no denying that. But those are two budgets. You have the police department budget and you have the school department budget. Use the school department budget to hire the guidance counselors that we need and reduce their individual caseload and keep the policemen there. Two weeks ago, his school was in lockdown because some Someone or someone's stole trees and knives inside Roger Williams Middle School. Now, do you honestly think that me wants them to take the police out of school? It's unfortunate that we have to have them. But unfortunately, it is the reality. It sounds good to take them out. That's a great progressive idea. But it is not realistic. Not now. Maybe someday, maybe when you and I went to school, you didn't need a policeman in the school. They would come in once a month, officer friendly, and give you candy bars and God knows what, and acquaint you with the police. Those days are gone. It's unfortunately, those days are gone. Looking at the city's pension system, there are a variety of uh, solutions, but it's not uh, an issue where one specific solution would act as a silver bullet. As a city councilor, what solutions would you uh, favor to try and solve the issue of the pension system? Well, you know, the city pension fund has suffered a severe blow. The fire department, for whatever reason, and I'm not even going to go there, 100 firefighters retired right around the same time, taking the money that they put into the pension fund, which is their right. But let's look at this in dollars and cents. That is their right to withdraw their contribution. There is nothing wrong with that. But you have 100 people at once, senior people, who have paid the most in withdrawing their money. And now instead of contributing to the system, they're taking, their, they grab, they're taking a, a monthly pay, a pension, which of course they're entitled to, okay? 
that weakens the financial pension system and they're not making the right investments, not making the right investments doesn't help. And now you have even less money to invest. So not only did you drive the five minutes to retirement, you've also, the mayor is the chairman of the uh, investment board for the pension fund, which is unheard of. But whoever, they made the wrong investments. We got a smaller yield than what we should have gotten, what the state got, what Set Magazine got. The comparison is, is like night and day. And it was the same period of time that we're talking of. It was the same period. Set comes up with, I don't know how much uh, yield, and the city of Providence comes up with that much. So you, you figure it out. But from what I from what I can tell, they are they are not investing that money wisely, and there's been a a lot of abuse in that system as well. So it sounds like more in, uh, in uh, properly investing the money. Uh, what about something like the pension obligation bond that Mayor Lewis is proposing? We can't let the pension system collapse. You cannot tell someone that worked for the city, worked for the fire department, worked for the police department, worked in the school system, well, we don't have any more money to pay you now that you're 75 years old. You can't do that. We're going to have to meet that obligation one way or another. So you're in favor of the pension obligation bond? I am in favor of doing whatever we've got to do to save that pension system. If you take that obligation bond, bond and you reinvest it properly, that's fine. But in order to invest, you have to have money, and they have no money. So therefore, what are the alternatives? You really don't have an alternative there. Moving on to the next topic, this is more of a ward-specific uh, topic. Windmill Elementary School will be seeing a remodel and will act as a swing space that will accommodate students uh, who are displaced from their own schools due to construction. Then in the long term, the city hopes to transform the building into a dedicated school facility. What are your thoughts on this plan for Windmill? I think it's about time. I went to school there, I watched that building deteriorate from negligence from the city government. Negligence. They, we had a strong building there that they just allowed it to crumble. They allowed it to crumble and shame on them. And now they finally put $34 million into it to try to rehabilitate it. It became an eyesore, it became a fire hazard, it became everything that it wasn't supposed to be. And now it's on the swing, so that's a good thing for that community. I understand it was my idea, of, well, I know it was my idea, to name it after the uh, present councilman, uh, Nick Narducci, the Narducci Learning Center. I think that's an appropriate name for a man and his family that have given a lot to that community. While on the topic of education, the role charter schools should have in the city is hot button issue is the best way to put it. In your opinion, what role should charter schools have in the city? I think they should have an active role. I uh, put my little man there into a, the lottery the other day. Uh, he's 19 on the list to go to achievement first. So we're going to go to the school. We're going to take a look at it. And we'll see. It's a learning experience for me because when I went to school, we didn't have charter schools. <laughs> the defund the police movement, shifting just to public safety, the defund the police movement, you kind of touched upon this a bit in your answer. It's sort of died down in recent months. However, there are calls to say what they now say is the city needs to reimagine public safety. And when I say that, I mean the, the more like progressive democratic wing of the party. Uh, to some, that may sound like a dog whistle where you're taking police department funds and putting it in other areas, thus still defunding. Where do you stand on the calls to defund the police or even reimagine public safety? Very simple. The people that want to defund the police have never been the victims of crime. I've been through holdups. You don't want to defund the police when you see someone coming in with a bag over their head. Actually, it's from a cheap store, not even a good store like Nordstrom. Uh, you really do not want to defund the police at that point. I think we've already successfully defunded the police by having 100 policemen down. And this is what we have. Shootings every night. I call one day that we could hear shots fired from the Branch Avenue area, and I called the police department to find out what was going on. And they said, I said, I have a young man I have to send to the bus stop. And their answer was, don't send him now, Joe. Don't send him now. 
I live long enough to see that it's not safe to send a kid to the bus stop. We've already defunded the police. It's 100 policemen shot. The Mountain Command only has two police officers. So anybody who wants to defund the police, like I said, and whether they like it or whether they don't, they've never been victims of crime. They've never had a business that they had to worry about having the plate glass windows broken into. They've never had children that had to worry about getting addicted to drugs because there was nobody to, to realign the corners and people hanging on the corners. I'm not saying that we want a police state. And I'm not saying we want a hostile police or police department. We want a police department that is in tune with the rest of the community to their needs, their wants, their desires. Number one thing, when I went to work at that police department, I went there in 1972 and I remember midnight, there were no blacks. There were no gays. Oh, I'm sorry. We had five black people uh, spread throughout the building. We had two women. We had no Hispanics. That was wrong. Now we have everybody. And we need everybody. Because it has to be reflective of the city that we live in. And I'm not so sure that that was not reflective even at that time. And as a result, when I started there, they had the little, little numbers on your chest, the badges. And if someone was beating you up, and I went to look to get the guy's number to report him, I'd get a beaten too. So then the Alton Wiley class action suit, and he was successful, thankfully, with the big brass numbers. Now you could see. And so there's some degree of accountability. There always has to be, have a degree of accountability. You know, people have to be better educated. They have to be more in tune with the times that they live in and they have to be more compassionate. And that's not education. That's just who you are. You can be as educated as anything. If you have no compassion, you don't belong with that badge on. And you certainly don't belong with a gun. You know, I spent 20 years on the civilian staff there. I think I know a little bit about how that place should operate or should or should not operate. I've seen good policemen. I've seen policemen that won't pass the psych test. I've seen dangerous policemen. And I've also seen compassionate people. You get a whole uh, smorgasbord of people there. And anybody who thinks that the policemen like a bad cop, no. They ostracize them socially. They really do. A, a good policeman does not like a bad policeman. They just don't go running around saying it. They just socially ostracize them. They don't go out for drinks after. they When they double date with their wives and whatever, they make sure they don't. You know what I'm saying? They hold them at bay. You know, the public seems to think that the police department protects its own. To a certain extent, it does too. But they, they put on a good face. Basically, they don't like some of the bad cops either because it reflects back on them and makes their job that much harder. And it also can get them in severe trouble if they're there and you have a policeman who's wailing on somebody for, for no apparent reason. Who wants to be in front of the FBI and answering questions? They don't want that. You know, so a lot of it has to do with staying on top of uh, the disciplinary action of the police department itself of their own men. They just can't look the other way. Speaking of the still on the public safety topic, there are calls for more community policing. Where do you stand on, on uh, community policing? Well, I know a little bit about that because for part of those 20 years, I was in the community substations. Uh, community policing is not a new idea. My gosh, we were doing that when Ronald Reagan became president. Uh, I remember working that day and watching the inauguration on the television. So that's not a new idea. It's a very important idea. It brings you in touch with the community. But again, you have to have the policemen who go out into the community, not in a car, on foot. Forget the car. The car's fine. But if you want to do community policing, you need men on foot and you need men and women in cars. And you need men and women on foot as well. You need that whole, uh, a whole approach, a total approach. You know, when I worked at the uh, substation on Brook Street, we had a bicycle police officers, and they would go up and down. We had someone for Wickedham Street, all that area, 
to walk all of that area, ride their bicycle all that area. We also had Thea Street. We had two men there on Thea to get to know people, to get to know the students. Again, not as a police state, but as a form of communication. Shifting the topic to what things could look like if you're elected. If you're elected, you'd be sworn in in January 2023. And one of the first things you'd have to do is vote for the new council president. Are there any um, city councilors in mind that you'd vote for for that council president role? I haven't given a thought to it. Is there anybody that on this... Any current city council member that you think would be qualified for the job? I haven't given a thought to it. Looking to committee assignments, and that would be another thing you'd have to decide what committees you'd be on, want to be on. Is there any specific committees you'd want to be on? Uh, the Board of with? Park Commissioners. I'm sorry, what was the committee? The Board of Park Commissioners. And um, in January 2023, aside from there being a new council president, there will also be a new mayor because current Mayor Jorge Lorza, for those watching, is uh, term limited. Uh, is there anybody out of those candidates currently running right now for mayor that you plan to support? I haven't made a decision, but Brett Smiley is a good and decent soul. Uh, everybody that's running for mayor is a good and decent soul. I've known all of them, with the exception of uh, with the woman from the east side. I've never met her. But obviously, I know Gonzalo Cuervo, Brett Smiley is a friend of mine, Michael Solomon, and I go back many, many years. They're all qualified. There's no question about it. They're all qualified. They all have their heart in the right place. That's for darn sure. Shifting to non-political topics, I learned right before we actually started filming that you're a Rick alumni, you're a alumnus, I should say. 1973. You, class, of, uh, class of 73. Um, what was your time like as a Rick student? What was my time like as a Rick student? Time there? Yeah, like what was it like? Did you enjoy it? Were you involved on campus? Well, it was okay, but I had to work at that police department. So I didn't have a lot of time to spend there because I had to get to work. <laughs> Which was okay. I mean, it taught me a great deal. You know, there's a question of whether I learned more at the police department about life or whether I learned more at uh, the college. And I'm not going to tell you which. <laughs> And uh, my final question, this is a non-political topic one. I ask everyone this on the show to keep tradition, and that is, in your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? Tourism. Newport. Right above us. The State House there. Roger Williams Park. There are a lot of good things here. Well, that's all the time we have. Joe, I all want right. to thank you thank so you. much for taking the time to make this interview happen. And thank you for watching this episode of Reality TV. If you want to see future episodes as soon as they're posted on this channel, please click both the subscribe button down below and the post notification bell icon to the right of it. I'm Raymond Bakari, and I'll see you on the next episode.